Hello, everyone. My name is James Testaverde, and I am the Senior Director of Patient Services at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Welcome, and thank you all for attending tonight's webcast, Know the Basics, Understanding Clinical Trials, offered in partnership with ResearchMatch. ResearchMatch.org is an online matching service that facilitates customized matching of participants to medical research studies. After the presentation, we will open up the program for your questions. I now have the pleasure of introducing our presenters for today's program. Catherine Greger has 10 years of clinical research experience, having worked in a multitude of clinical settings, and has published and consulted on clinical research operations in both private and academic practice nationwide. She has frontline clinical experience, having worked as a clinical coordinator on a number of industry-sponsored and investigator-initiated trials throughout her tenure. Catherine currently works as a project manager for the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. Her primary areas of responsibility are to serve as project lead for Research Match, a disease-neutral online volunteer researcher matching service funded by the National Center for Advancement of Translational Science. Catherine has an MBA from Belmont University and is certified by both the Society of Clinical Research Associates and the Association of Clinical Research Professionals. Leslie Boone is a project manager with CTSA Consortium Coordinating Center and coordinates the postdoctoral fellows for the Meharry Vanderbilt Community Engaged Research Program within the Institute for Medicine and Public Health at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Within her role as project manager, she works with Research Match to develop a framework for research dissemination. Ms. Boone's academic and personal interests are in health services research, developing community initiatives, and behavioral research with a focus on sexually transmitted diseases and informed decision making. Ms. Boone has a Master of Public Health degree from Emory University. I would now like to turn the program over to Catherine. Thank you, James. So just to give you a quick overview of today's objectives, we're going to discuss the role of clinical trials in advancing research, review the methods and process of a trial, including the different phases of a study, review common features of trials for inflammatory bowel diseases, such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and discuss resources that are available to you where you can find out more information about the things you hear today. Next slide. So I wanted to start this talk by answering the question, what is a clinical trial? I think a clinical trial is something that we hear a lot about in the news um, and on TV, but sometimes people don't really know what that means. So if we were to get at the root of what a clinical trial is, it's a very simple answer, and that it's a research trial carefully designed to answer an important medical question. Specifically, we're looking at how new drugs or combinations of drugs can affect um, outcomes in patients like yourself, if they can prevent or possibly cure diseases. We're looking at new procedures or devices, um, specifically different types of devices to diagnose or treat different types of diseases. And we're also looking at new ways of using existing treatments. So drugs that were previously approved for one type of therapy might actually have an implication in a different patient population if we look at them. Um, in a different capacity. We'll also look at types of care such as improving the quality of life for people with chronic illnesses. So what can we do to reduce the amount of daily pain, lack of sleep, disruption to your daily schedule? Um, can we alter the way that we treat diseases with medication or with therapies outside of medicine such as alternative medicine or exercise programs? And see if that improves the quality of life overall and results in a better day-to-day -day existence for people living with chronic diseases. Sometimes you might hear that these clinical trials referred to as an interventional study or a clinical study. They're really the same thing. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is figure out what's safe and what's effective in the population at large. Next slide. So I don't know if any of you know this, but there's been a lot of study about the length of clinical trials and how long it takes for a drug to get approved to market. We hear a lot in newspapers about new discoveries every day at research centers like Vanderbilt and Harvard, um, pharmaceutical companies coming up with new molecules that they would like to test that will ultimately become a drug. And people wonder why it takes so long from the time you first hear about this drug to the time that you're actually able to get it from your provider. And evidence has shown that it takes on average 13 to 20 years from the time something is discovered in a lab to the time that it's actually available for you and your patient care so that you can get it from your doctor. 
So ideally, if we looked at something that was discovered today in our lab here at Vanderbilt, it would not be available to you until 2032. That's a really long time. So we were wondering, what, why is, there, is the timeline so long? What are the holdups, and what can we do to make this timeline shorter? Next slide. So the first thing we can do is take a look at why it takes so long to get to market. This um, infographic that you see here is something that I found a while back, and it is just astounding. If you think of the fact that it starts off with 10,000 different compounds can come out of a lab at any time. And a compound is something as simple as a new molecule. And from 10,000 of those, 250 of them will actually get into preclinical studies, which means they're looking at them in animals to determine what kind of safety profile they have, whether or not they show any efficacy at all. And from those 250, maybe five of them will actually make it into clinical trials where we're testing them in humans. And from that, only one of those five will ultimately result in a approved therapy that will be available to you through your doctor. So from 10,000 to one, that's the odds of making it. And it seems like it's pretty daunting. And a lot of factors play into that. And some of that is that compounds prove not to be as effective as they thought they were when we actually get them into animals or into humans. Another thing is the cost of the amount to manufacture the drug, that the cost doesn't warrant um, the continued research. And the other part is that really the, that somebody else has, the, has, the, has trouble recruiting. I'm sorry. <laughs> Minor stutter. Um, that we can't get patients to participate in clinical trials, which is one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we're going to talk to you about here today. Next slide. So when I talk about recruitment and I talk about patients, studies from this group called CSCRIP, which is the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, um, they did a large sampling of a lot of people who have participated in clinical research or who have thought about participating in clinical research, as well as the number of stats with actual pharmaceutical companies and some of the effects that they've seen when they actually try to run clinical trials. And their stats show that 50% of clinical research sites enroll one or no patients in their study. So that means that a sponsor may have as many as 300 sites. So 300 different doctor's offices are participating in this clinical study. And of those 300, 150 of them may never get a patient to volunteer. So why is that? Another stat that's pretty interesting is that 80% of total trials are delayed at least one month because of unfulfilled enrollment. So when a sponsor like Pfizer sets out to conduct a clinical trial, they have a target end date in mind, meaning that they want to try and get all of their patients to volunteer and participate by the end of 2017. And then if they can't make that deadline, that means that it's going to take longer to get them enrolled, it's going to cost more money, and they're late to market, which in their mind is money. So 80% of these trials take longer than targeted to targeted time. So think of that if that was an airline and 80% of your flights were delayed, you would be hard pressed to continue to fight on to get more trials through your pipeline. Each day a drug is delayed to market, sponsors lose up to $8 million for the company. So if we can actually get more people involved and help increase the number of people who participate and decrease some of those delays in enrollment, we can help get more drugs to market faster. Next slide. So what if we could take the whole process down to five years? What if we can go from 2015 to 2020? That's a lot better, right? Well, there's a number of people interested in solving this problem and getting it down to five years. CCFA is one of those groups. Research Match is one of those groups. And a number of people have come together to try and think creatively about how we can decrease the amount of time it takes a drug to get from the bench in the lab to the bedside to the patient where they can ultimately make the biggest impact in somebody's life. And so one of the ways we thought about that is by talking to people about clinical trials and helping them understand some of the issues that surround them and make them seem more approachable to the average patient. And that's part of the emphasis behind why we're talking to you here today. Next slide. So right now I'm actually going to hand this over to my colleague, Ms. Boone. Um, Leslie has actually participated in the clinical trial. I think you heard James introduce us both. I've done a lot in terms of talking to patients about clinical trials, but I have never actually had the honor of participating in one. So I wanted to give participation to somebody who actually has participated. So on the screen before you, there is a poll that we'd like you all to, to um, participate in. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience in participating in a clinical trial back in the late 90s. I was a young college student. Um, 
I probably didn't know much about clinical trials, but thought it would be an option for me at the time um, because I did have a medical condition that I was interested in learning more about. One thing that um, I think interested me in the clinical trials that I had a trusting relationship with my physician who knew what I was struggling with and suggested that the trial could be an option for me. Now, mind you, it wasn't, um, I didn't have a, uh, a life-threatening issue, but it was something of concern. And so this was an option for me um, to participate. And I learned a lot about myself and also about my relationship with my doctor because I learned a lot more information um, than we had ever shared during a doctor's visit because she had to document so many things for the trial. So right now, I'll give you um, a moment to um, participate in the poll. And we want to know, have you ever participated or are you currently participating in a clinical trial? Wow, it seems that 95% of you all who are on the line currently have not participated in a clinical trial. So <clears throat> that's, that's very interesting. And maybe some of you are caregivers. Maybe some of you have been thinking about participating in a clinical trial but have not had um, an interest as of yet, or just maybe no one has asked you. So we do have a follow-up question for those of you who answered no. And we'd like to know, if you answered no, which 95% of you did, what would you say is the main reason? And I'd like to point out, Leslie, that actually 95% of the population not participating in research is actually right on par with the national average. Mm -hmm. And at Research Match, we are trying to increase those numbers. Um, we, we certainly don't think that everyone has to participate in a trial, but it could be an option for some and maybe an option that has not been considered. So do we have the results of the poll? So 22% of you said not in my study area, 11% said you didn't meet criteria, 22% of you said you were afraid of the risks involved, 17% said that you don't feel knowledgeable, and 28% gave another reason. And I think part of the reason why we asked this question is because those, the answers that are up here are fairly common. Not understanding or feeling comfortable with what's going on in the clinical trial is a very common feeling among patients that we talk to. Um, not being sure of the risk involved and understanding how that's calculated is also a very common concern. So hopefully we can give you some tools to address those. Right. And for those of you who answered other, um, I know from looking at the literature and from um, surveying our own population here at Research Match, we know that sometimes transportation can be an issue. Sometimes uh, it's the time it takes to participate that may also be a barrier for your to participation, as well as day-to-day -day things like childcare, um, taking off from work. There, there are numerous reasons um, why you may have chosen other at this time. But we hope that as we um, work better with our physicians and doctors' offices and other sponsors of research, that we can help them understand what bar what barriers do exist and help them to create more um, trials that meet the needs for your lives. Um, next slide. So why don't people participate? I think we've, we've listed some of the things that you have identified. And I think I just said, you know, sometimes it's transportation. You know, there, there are lots of day-to-day -day things. But sometimes it's just lack of opportunity. No one has asked you. Um, and sometimes it's a lack of knowledge, um, as, as you indicated through the poll that you don't know what you're eligible for. Um, healthy volunteers can participate in clinical trials just as well as those who may be dealing with the condition. And also lack of comfort. If you have not had a lot of experience with the medical profession, then you may not be comfortable in a medical setting thinking about what's going to happen to you. Um, but the great thing about participation is that if they're really good, they will walk you through all of these um, barriers and help you to feel more comfortable so that you can participate and learn more about um, yourself and whatever condition that we're trying to um, solve. 
And ultimately, it's important to emphasize that you as a volunteer are crucial to the conduct of research. Uh, that was something that I was trying to relay when I talked about some of the barriers to enrollment. Without people to participate, there can be no discovery. So really, it is the job of the physician and the recruiter who's talking to you to help you feel comfortable and to help you understand what's about to happen in a clinical trial. Any question you ask should be answered, and it should be answered to the extent that you're satisfied. So never be afraid to ask a question. Um, it's really the people conducting the trial are there to help you. All right, next slide. All right, so one of the first things that we wanted to talk about is deciding whether to participate in a clinical trial. Ultimately, you're going to find out when you go in. The first document they give you when you're talking about a clinical trial is going to be your informed consent form. An informed consent form is a very large document. It can be up to 11 pages. I've seen some that go as much as 20 pages when you're dealing with some uh, more advanced therapies, particularly around cancer. Um, but the reason why this document is so long is because they're trying to give you as much information in writing up front as they can so that you can take the time to ask the questions of the clinical provider that you're dealing with, ask the questions of your friends and family, get their opinions on what you, they think you should do if you feel comfortable asking them, and also to take the time to carefully go through and read all the information so that you feel comfortable before making a decision. Nobody should ever give you an informed consent form and ask you to sign it in the same visit right off the bat. You really should have time to go through it all and think about it and ask deliberate questions and make sure that this is something that you feel 100% comfortable with as you move forward. Um, some points that we want to point out about the informed consent form is that the FDA requires volunteers to give information before they participate. So you have to sign a consent form before anybody does anything related to a clinical trial. That means even abstracting data from your medical chart, or asking you questions about how you feel about certain things, informed consent really is the start of this relationship. So it should happen prior to any other information gathering. Informed consent documents include information about the purpose of the clinical trial. What are they trying to find out? Um, why are you being asked to participate in it? A description of what the trial is hoping to accomplish. A description of what procedures will be conducted while you're in the clinical trial. Um, and they can be very detailed, all the way down to the number of blood draws, the amount of blood they'll draw, um, how much time you're expected to spend in the clinic so that you know how much time to schedule. Any type of internal exams or invasive exams should all be listed in your, in your consent form. A complete description of the risks involved in the clinical trial. So that means risks involved with the drug. That means risk to your confidentiality. If you have concerns about that, that information needs to be addressed in a consent process. Risk about blood draws. We even have to write down the fact that you may get a bruise if we draw blood or that you could get an infection from a needle um, when you draw blood, which are common risks when you draw blood in general. But because we're in a trial and we want to make sure that we dispel as many concerns about risks as we can, we lay it all out for you on, on the risk section. And it should also talk to you about any possible benefits that can come from a trial. So whether or not this drug is expected to impact your, your life or impact your clinical diagnosis, whether or not your participation will result in the benefit of society, meaning that you'll help gather more information about something that is unknown, which can benefit future generations. Or if there are no benefits, they should tell you there's no expected benefits. And this is common when you deal with end-stage um, cancer trials. Sometimes we're really just trying to find knowledge, and there will be no personal benefit to the patient. But that is the greatest gift that they can give us. And so there's always um, some language about that as well. There should also be information about alternatives, so alternative treatment options. Information letting you know that participating in this clinical trial is not the only option available to you um, in terms of treating your disease. There are other methods available that are what we call standard of care, meaning common medical practice. Or an alternative could be not to participate and not to receive any treatment at all. That is your right as a patient um, as well. It should also give you information about compensation. Are they giving you um, compensation for the time off that you have to take from work? Are they reimbursing for travel expenses? Um, is there any compensation available if you're treated or if you're injured during the conduct of the trial? Also, any information about who to contact if you are injured in a clinical trial, or if you have questions about participating in a clinical trial. You should have a 24-hour emergency contact number for a physician who's responsible for the oversight of your care while you're in the clinical trial. And all consent forms will also give you a number to something that's called an institutional review board. 
An institutional review board is an external committee that is responsible for making sure that all clinical trials conducted at a site, so at a doctor's office or at a university, meet the basic requirements of the Code of Federal Regulations, um, which is the FDA safety regulations for clinical trials. And they um, are there to accept patient complaints. They can be done anonymously or in person. So if you had a complaint or a question and didn't feel comfortable talking to somebody at the doctor's office where you're being seen, you can call the Institutional Review Board and somebody there will um, get in touch with whoever needs to be spoken to on your behalf without having to make you do it if you don't feel comfortable. Also information about the fact that you have the right to refuse um, treatment on the clinical trial or to withdraw yourself from the clinical trial. So if at any point you said yes to a study and you get a couple visits in and you decide this just doesn't feel right, I don't see benefit or it's taking too much time or really I just don't want to do this anymore, you have the right to walk away at any point without penalty to your treatment or penalty by the provider. Um, you do not have to continue to participate all the way through to the end of the study if you decide that it's no longer a benefic benefit to you or to, your, um, to the person that you're helping. Also, the fact that the doctor can withdraw you for safety reasons. So if there's something that comes down um, from another state that's participating that shows that there's a different risk or a threat to safety of patients, they have to tell you that up front and they will withdraw you from the study. <coughs> also, there should be information about confidentiality. Who's going to have access to your medical information? How your information will be shared between the doctor, the clinical, or the pharmaceutical sponsor, and the FDA? Um, as well as what would happen if there was a confidentiality breach. What are your what information is protected by HIPAA and what is your recourse to um, seek redress for that? Also, they'll let you know if clinical trials are registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov is an external website that is run by the government that all clinical trials that meet certain criteria are required to register and provide updates on. You can access it at www.clinicaltrials.gov um, and it will give you the number and registration ID for that study so that you can go on and see what is posted there if you so choose. Next slide. <coughs> so if that wasn't enough information in one document, the FDA has also added six additional elements meaning that they want to make sure that there is a statement that there may be risks which are unforeseeable. So as I mentioned before, sometimes when you get into the conduct of a clinical study after a couple of years, you start to notice that there's something, an additional safety risk. And we may not have known that when we started, but part of the idea of clinical trials is to identify those risks of, um, so that we know them and we can communicate them to others. So there should be a statement about that and then what they'll do when the information arises and how you'll be informed of any additional change in risk. Under what circumstances the investigator can terminate your participation. So like I just said, if there was an issue with safety, the investigator who is your doctor can remove you from the study. Any additional cost to you that may be um, part of participating in the clinical trial. <coughs> Sometimes, um, up until recently, there were some pushback by insurance, but actually as of 2010, Medicare decided that they would cover um, standard of care costs, so complementary care for people participating in clinical trials, and most private insurances have followed suit since then, so that hopefully will become less of an issue as we move forward. Um, when will research findings be disclosed to you? So when will the information that comes out from the clinical trial be made public? The approximate number of people participating in the study? How many other people like you are there? How many people are we trying to get into this study? Um, is it 20? Is it 300? Is it 4,000? What is the goal? and that the fact that you can still decide to withdraw from a study at any time. So we want to reinforce this twice because it's very important for people to understand. You can quit at any time if you don't feel comfortable, and that should be stated and made explicitly clear to you before you participate. Next slide. So that is informed consent. So the next thing we wanted to talk to you about is some basic methods and trial design. So when you start to get out there and look at different types of protocol titles. Those are usually printed on your informed consent forms, or if you get on clinicaltrials.gov or CCFA's clinical trial website, and you see these, cl these trials for protocols, you're going to see words like randomized, double blind, placebo. And you're like, what does this mean to me? I don't know what randomized means. Well, we're going to tell you. So randomized usually means that there are two or more treatments 
available in the trial. So basically somebody, um, the pharmaceutical company is looking at one new drug versus a placebo or a pre-existing drug to see which one has a better effect in the patient population. And that these treatment assignments are assigned by chance. Most often they're assigned by a computer-generated program so that it's as random as flipping a coin, whether or not you will receive one treatment versus another. Sometimes they'll do what's called cohort stratification, which means every other person gets put into a treatment group, um, which is a little bit different, but still it's very random in that the sequence in which you sign up is random. Another type of trial you're going to hear about is a double blind. And a double blind means that neither you nor your doctor know which treatment you are receiving. Sometimes they'll go as far as a triple blind, which means neither you, your doctor, nor the pharmacist who's prescribing the medication knows which one you're receiving. And the reason for that is because they're trying to counter against something that's called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is something uh, that scientists first started to notice a couple decades ago, actually, that people who knew that they were involved in a clinical trial and thought that they were receiving investigational agents would say that they felt better just because they knew they were in a trial and they're like, hey, I should feel better. So they started to report that they felt better because generally when you become more conscious of your health and you take a more interested role in what's going on, you'll start to feel a little bit better about what you do on a day-to-day -day life. And so in order to counter against that and also to counter against judgment on the half of the doctor saying, I think I know which one he's on and I think that this is what's going on, they decided to go ahead and create blinding. So blinding helps keep everybody in the dark because we don't know what we're on. So any positive outcomes that you see or feel really should be tied to the treatment and not just a perception of how you think you should be responding. A placebo is um, an inactive product that usually resembles the study drug or study device. Sometimes in a device study they call it a sham, which means that it's just a dummy device. Um, in the drug, it means that it's pretty much the look and feel of whatever the active treatment is, but it doesn't have the key molecule that I was talking about in the beginning. That's the active agent that actually changes how the body metabolizes that drug. Um, and like I said, they do it so that you don't know what you're on. So those are some basic underlying methods of how we do clinical trials. Most clinical trials that you participate in are going to be randomized, they are going to be double blind, and they are going to be placebo controlled. Those are the most commonly encountered types of clinical trials in the market today. Next. So with that, we wanted to talk about the different phases. So you saw me just with my infographic before that we go from 10,000 different types of compounds down to one eventually approved drug. And along the way, there's a couple of different steps. And the first step in that process is what we call the preclinical phase. So this is what we, which is usually experiments done in vitro, which means in a cell or a test tube. So we're checking how a different molecule interacts with different genetic material. Or in vivo, which means that it's done in animals. And the reason why we do that is to see how it's metabolized by different types of organs um, to see if there is any type of effect um, on, the, on the biochemistry of the animal that, we can, that might be a danger if we put it into humans. Um, usually these are wide-ranging doses of active drugs, and the reason why is because they want to see what's the maximum toxicity or the biggest load of a dose that they can give before we start to see negative effects so they know where the ceiling is, and then they want to see which is the most, where the bottom is, meaning how much drug do they have to give at a minimum to see any type of effect in the chemistry and processing of, of the material. They're also looking to see how the drug moves through the body. Most drugs are metabolized either by the liver or the kidneys and figuring out which organ that's going to affect by this particular molecule. And they're also designed to determine if potential drugs have um, scientific merit, meaning that they are worthy of further development into an IND, which is an actual term that is um, short for investigational new drug application, which is something that the FDA requires every pharmaceutical company to file before they move into clinical trial testing in humans. Um, and that means that from that point on, they're going to go into the different phases of clinical trial and test them through humans, and they have to report back to the FDA um, at every point along those phases to let them know what they're seeing, and the FDA will determine whether or not they can move forward, and ultimately if their drug will be approved for market. Next slide. 
So from preclinical, we move into what we call phase one. Phase one is usually the first time a drug or, de um, or device is tested in humans. It's tested in a very small amount of healthy volunteers, usually between 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. And the reason why they start in healthy populations, if possible, is because we don't want to make somebody who's sick sicker unnecessarily. Phase one clinical trials in cancer patients usually are given to people who have cancer already. Um, and those are usually end of, end of life type of situations. So basically, they're looking for it, what is a safe dose? So we know from our preclinical testing what the maximum dose is and what the minimum dose is. And before we move into phase one, they've usually narrowed it down to three doses that are in the relatively safe range. Um, and they want to figure out what it has the most benefit to the body with the least amount of risk. And so that's why they test in, in healthy populations. Moving from there, they go to phase two. Phase two studies are really looking at safety and, infect and effectiveness. Are there any short-term side effects? So anything that happens immediately after dosing with a drug. So are, is there any rash that accompanies the drug? Do you have headaches? Do you feel dizzy? Um, does your heart beat faster? These are things that we want to know about in short-term side effects. We're also narrowing down criteria for selection, which means that we're trying to figure out which population with the disease is going to benefit the most from this drug. So is it somebody with diabetes who's well-controlled, or, or do we need to look at a population that's a little bit higher on the glucose level that um, is going to see a bigger effect with this drug and it will be of more benefit to them? Phase two is usually tested on a larger group of people. Um, they're looking at a group of 100 to 300. Unlike phase one trials, phase two trials usually involve patients who have the disease or condition that's being studied, as I just mentioned. And the goal is really to study how effective and safe the treatment is in a larger group over time and to figure out, do patients improve? Do we see a marked difference in how, they, in, of how their body reacts to the disease after taking a treatment? Phase three, that's the next step. Phase three is looking at whether or not it's better than standard treatment. So we already know what the safe dose of this new drug is, but if we compare it to something that's already available or on the market, is it more effective? The FDA will never allow us to look at something to prove that it's less effective. They want us to either be as good or better than what's currently available. And that's common practice and common sense, right? We want to make sure that any new treatments we are looking at are actually going to benefit us and make things better. We never want to come in and say, oh, you were right. That other drug you had on the market is way better than this one. Um, that is not the not standard course of testing. They're looking to evaluate, again, risk and benefit, hopefully more benefit, less risk. And these studies are actually the most expensive and difficult studies to enroll because they involve the largest patient population. Phase three studies usually look at a group um, between 1,000 to 3,000 patients, and they last a number of years. And this is actually, if you were in a pharmaceutical company, the phase that they call the valley of death because this is the place where most drugs don't make it out into phase four trials. Um, a lot of drugs get discontinued in phase three because they turn out not to be as effective as they thought. Patients are not as compliant because the drug doesn't make them feel good and they are no longer willing to take the drug. So pharmaceutical companies will decide that it's no longer worth pursuing this application. So this is where you go from year five to year one, um, the number of drugs that are really going to make it out to the market. Phase four clinical trials. <clears throat> are usually conducted after the government has approved a treatment for market. So they're looking at long-term safety effects of a drug after it's been approved. So it's already shown that it's effective and it's safe enough to be available to the population through their doctor. But now they want to see if there's any long-term side effects that we didn't discover in the first 10 to 15 years of testing. If after 20 years we start to see something a little bit different that we need to reconsider how drugs are approved. They're going to look at observation of serious side effects. So a serious side effect is something that results in a hospitalization or a medical intervention or ultimately in death or a congenital birth defect. So they're looking to see if there's anything that pops up that really changes how people's lives are affected when they take this drug. By the time you get into phase four clinical trials, there should not be any unexpected serious adverse events. Most of that information comes out in the early phases of testing. And that's why they start on small populations, so they can catch it before the number of people who are exposed to the drug um, gets larger. They're also going to test in groups in special populations, so seeing if there's any differentiation between men and women, or people with uh, worse condition um, or who are worse off on the spectrum than others. 
Um, so if you were looking at somebody with diabetes, again, you might look at somebody who's more controlled versus somebody who's more or less controlled. Um, and that is that on phase four. All right, next slide. So the phases of clinical trial, there's five. And these phases are fairly common no matter what type of clinical trial you're looking at. And there are several types of clinical trials available. Most trials that you guys are going to come across in your daily lives are treatment trials, meaning that we're looking to find a new treatment that's going to affect how people live their lives and how they handle their disease. So we really want to look more at drugs and devices that are implanted in these type of trials. Another type of trial is something that's called a prevention trial, which can sometimes happen when you're looking at a healthy population. They're looking to see if there's a preventive measure that can decrease the risk of developing a condition later on in life. Um, some common types of trials that revolve around this are heart disease, whether or not um, aspirin is a preventative measure, an effective preventative measure against the development of stroke or heart attack is one example of a type of a preventive trial. Another type of trial is a diagnostic trial. And this type of trial is usually looking at a lab or an imaging type of test to determine if one type of test is better at identifying a disease early on or more sensitive to identifying a disease, meaning that it takes less time or less genetic material to pick up a viral count or pick up a disease present in the bloodstream. And then there are the quality of life trials. Quality of life trials are really looking at whether or not a change in medicine habits or a change in alternative therapy can improve the quality of life of an individual living with a disease. So do you sleep better? Do you have less pain if you take this drug? Does that make, does this cancer drug cause less pain than this other cancer drug in your bones? And so you're, therefore you're able to sleep better, you feel more awake, you're able to accomplish more during your day, and ultimately your quality of life is better with this drug than it was with a different drug. Compassionate use. Compassionate use trials are where we have determined that there is a drug available that is in an investigational stage that has shown benefit in a chronic um, condition or in a condition that is life-threatening, and the FDA has authorized certain extensions of that drug to the population outside of a clinical trial. So it's usually a one-person trial where they're trying to get an access to an investigational agent because it has the potential to save or drastically alter their life. Um, and again, I've worked in cancer for a long time, so a lot of my examples will come from cancer. It's very common in cancer trials to see compassionate use case scenarios. Next slide. So that's a little bit about the different types of trials. So what about the people who conduct these trials? Who are they and what are they called? Um, your clinical research team should be comprised of a principal investigator, and this is usually a physician, sometimes a nurse practitioner. And this clinician is responsible for leading the trial at that site, in that office, making sure that all the patients enrolled in the study are safe and that their information is collected according to plan and that their information gets to where it needs to be so that we can get what we need in order to determine whether or not a drug or treatment is safe. A clinical research coordinator is somebody that's going to interface with you every time you come into the clinic. This person is the person who's going to talk to you about your consent. They're going to tell you when your next visit is supposed to be. They're going to help get you in touch with whatever other clinicians you need to be in touch with, if you need to go somewhere for x-ray, um, if you need to be somewhere for blood draw. They are, they are going to be your lifeline in a clinical trial, and they are the people who you probably will become most familiar with because you see them so often. So it's very important that you feel that you trust your clinical coordinator. And a coordinator can be anybody from a MA, which is a medical assistant, all the way up to a nurse practitioner. Um, it's just somebody who's been designated by the investigator to oversee your care plan. Next slide. So clinical trials for inflammatory bowel disease. The, um, we wanted to give you some ideas of the types of the trials that are out there for you. Um, trials are appropriate for many different types of people, including those with IBD. Um, specific requirements vary by trial. So it depends on which trial we're looking at, whether or not your criteria would qualify. And you can talk more about that with your individual doctor. Um, the more people who take part in clinical trials, the, the faster we will find a better way to treat and potentially cure IBD. So the more people who participate, the shorter the timeline to discovery, and the more hope we can offer others out there who are living with the same disease. Next slide. Common features of IBD studies are that they are looking to identify an endpoint. So an endpoint is usually the goal 
of the clinical trial. Um, and endpoints around IBD typically resolve around system, symptom improvement. Do you feel less side effects when you participate or when you take a certain drug or follow a certain treatment plan? Do you have an improved quality of life? Are there less flare-ups? Is your daily routine less interrupted? Are you able to go longer without having to take interventive medication? Um, small bowel or colon healing. Do you see more restorative tissue after taking a certain drug or therapy? Reduction in need for other medications. Um, examples, corticosteroids. Do you have to rely on corticosteroids as heavily as you did at the beginning of the trial if they alter your treatment plan? And improvement in blood or stool markers of inflammation. So ultimately, if you see less of those is what you would be looking at. Next slide. Some special considerations for IBD studies. Um, age, pediatric clinical trials have um, different requirements for consent. And depending on which state you're in, it'll depend whether or not you need the mother or the father to uh, participate, to sign off on any of your consent form. Um, some states only require one parent, some states require both. So it's important to talk about that when you're looking at a treatment course for a child. And a lot of um, pediatric trials, if your child is above the age of 12, require something that's called assent, meaning that your child has to opt in as well. Um, and that is really for the respective persons and that your child at that point is old enough to kind of understand what's happening and tell you whether or not they're comfortable with what you and the physician are discussing. Financial considerations. Clinical trials often cover medication under investigation, but sometimes they do not um, cover other standard therapy. Um, so it's important to talk to your clinical coordinator about what is considered standard of therapy and what is research, meaning what's going to go to your insurance and what's going to be paid for by the study. Um, and that should be outlined very clearly for you before you begin participation in the clinical trial. Some studies provide continued medication for patients who respond after specified trial endpoint, um, meaning that if you are on a study that is looking at an active drug versus a placebo, if a study has shown significant effect on the active treatment, um, sometimes the sponsor and the FDA will allow them to offer the active treatment to anybody who had received placebo, and that's called a crossover study. And that's usually um, designed so that they can get the drug to as many people as they can um, because it has shown so much benefit. Next slide. So where can you go to find more information? You can look at clinical trials on ccfa.org um, at the website there. You can go to Research Match. Research Match has a tool that's called Trial Finder, which can help direct you through some of the information that's on clinicaltrials.gov. We scrape clinicaltrials.gov on a, a daily basis to pull down relevant clinical trial information so that to make it easier to find and easier to read. So check that out. You can always go to clinicaltrials.gov itself. It has all the information you could ever hope for and more on clinical trials being conducted in the US, as well as international trials. You can go to ccfapartners.org, which is CCFA's partnership um, with several academic centers designed to help get um, patients into a registry of patient reported outcomes so that they can help you get connected to trials that will match your criteria. Simply fill out an online survey and receive research updates and information about IBD through CCFA. And then ultimately, a great place to ask is your doctor. He, may, he or she may not know the answer, but they'll help get you connected. Um, all you have to do is ask. And that is that. Next slide. In the end, it's important to emphasize that we all want the same thing, whether you're somebody like myself who helps conduct clinical trials, or somebody like Leslie who's participated in clinical trials, or somebody like you who's just out there thinking about clinical trials. We all want a better life for ourselves and a less chance of, of future generations having to deal with the same disease. So working together, we can find answers faster. We want to go beyond the limits of financial contributions and allow for a bigger impact through research. You don't have to give money to to causes to help them find a cure, you can actually be the cure yourself. Um, and come check us out at researchmatch.org backslash partner backslash CCFA. And I believe that is the last slide. And this concludes the presentation. Great. Thank you, Catherine and Lovely, for that presentation. Uh, now we are going to enter the question and answer part of the program. So today's questions will be taken from our web participants. Uh, for everyone's benefit, please keep your questions without many personal details so that we can provide an answer that's general in nature. And please note that today's presenters are not medical doctors or gastroenterologists. Uh, they are experts in the area of clinical research. Therefore, in the interest of time, I also ask that you keep your questions related to the topic of clinical trials.
and to ask a question, uh, please use the Q&A box on the toolbar on the right side of your screen. So the first question for whoever would like to answer it um, is a, a two-parter. So I have been on many types of medications to manage my Crohn's disease and none seem to be helping control my symptoms and keep flares under control. Number one, is a clinical trial really a good option for me if I'm looking for another treatment? And then number two, what if I get a placebo? Okay. Well, I think that is an interesting question. I think that if you have been through a number of medications and feel that you have come to the end of your road that's available to you through regular physicians, clinical trials can be an option. Um, I think it will be necessary for you to have a frank conversation with your physician um, about what you're looking for and to go through some of the trial opportunities out there um, to see what might be a good fit for you. Uh, the trial finder tool that I mentioned before on Research Match actually has some filtering built around that exact option that you've run out of treatment options and are looking for different alternatives. And that can help direct you to some trials that may be a good starting point for that discussion. Um, and as far as whether or not you get a placebo, that is a risk in most clinical trials. Um, and unfortunately, it's a necessary evil, like I said, to make sure that we keep our data as clean as we can and that patients are reporting and doctors are reporting what's actually happening and not what they're perceived to be happening. Um, however, as you mentioned on the last slide there, even if you do receive a placebo, it, there is a chance that you could be in one of those trials that will extend over the active treatment once it's shown benefit. So just because you're on placebo doesn't mean that has to be the last thing that you receive there. Um, I think also, as Leslie talked about, there is some benefit for having that extra relationship with your physician. Mm -hmm. They get to know you in a different way. Um, Leslie, I don't know if you want to comment on that a little bit. I think that's really key that you do share your concerns with your physician and that they can look back at your dosing and other uh, factors that may be playing a part in the, um, the increasing severity of your symptoms. So like Catherine said, I do believe a clinical trial should still be one of the options that you have in your back pocket, but certainly um, talking more with your physician about your concerns is key. Great, thank you. The next question, um, if my ulcerative colitis gets better while I'm in the clinical trial, what will happen when the trial is closed? Will the medication be stopped even if I'm feeling better? So again, um, if your ulcerative colitis improves um, while you're on an experimental treatment you're under the auspice of a clinical trial, that is great. Um, that is definitely something they want to see. If the improvement is enough, um, they will open that arm up to extended care or the crossover um, because they want to maintain that side of the life. It's not always 100% that that will happen, though. So sometimes there is a chance that you will be taken off of that medication. Most trials um, those that I've ever conducted where there's been a significant increase in patient uh, quality of life have rolled into another phase of the study, and that is just anecdotal evidence on my half. Um, I don't know if I have a better answer than that. It really is, um, it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer, but to say that there's a chance you will be taken off and there's a chance you won't. And it's hard to say without knowing the type of trial going into it whether or not that'll be the case. Great, thank you. Next question. Uh, what happens if a person seems to be getting worse during a clinical trial? If you're getting worse during a clinical trial, you need to have a frank discussion with your doctor. Um, your doctor is closely observing you during this clinical trial and will be watching that. And nobody wants you to stay on a treatment if it's not working, and we definitely don't want you to stay on a treatment if it's making you feel worse. So your doctor will take you off a study um, if you are not showing improvement and, in fact, you're deteriorating. Um, that is, they will know, no, no good doctor will keep you on a study just to get data off of you at the point of suffering. So that should never happen. And if it does, feel free to remove yourself from the clinical trial as well. Um, don't, don't, don't deal with that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what did the investigators do with information on side effects during a trial? Uh, how can they determine whether a side effect is due to the study or to something else? 
It's a great question. So side effects um, in the whole, what we call in my terminology is safety reporting, um, are reported a number of different times. So you are reporting on a daily basis, basically, any side effects that you're experiencing or you're seeing in your patients to your sponsor. So to Pfizer, I tell them, hey, I had Mrs. Jones come in today and she's reporting that she's got side of, or she has headaches. Um, that are lasting more than several hours and are causing her to take over-the-counter medication. That gets reported out to your sponsor, and your sp sponsor takes all that information and collaborates it, and we start to see if there's a pattern. Um, they actually know which drug you're receiving, if you're receiving active or placebo, so they can break it into groups and see if headaches are more frequent in the groups that have active treatment. Um, different side effects if they are serious in nature, so some of those ones that I talked about before that require hospitalization or medical intervention, are reported to the FDA um, within 24 hours so that the FDA is aware of the safety information and then the sponsor has to disseminate that information to all the other doctors who are participating in the clinical trials as well. So we're constantly getting updates on the side effects that are being seen in the population um, both at our site and then in also other sites that are participating so that we are all well informed of what's being seen. And in terms of assessing whether or not something is related to a drug, your doctor can make a determination um, in his or her best judgment of whether or not it's related to the drug. Sometimes it has to do with the timing of when the event occurs. So are you getting headaches within 10 minutes of taking uh, the drug? Or are you getting headaches three days later? Because then the likelihood that that headache is related to the drug that you took three days ago is a little bit less than it is if it happened 10 minutes after taking the drug. Um, so some of that comes into play. Also, the sponsor can help determine um, relationship, like I said, by looking at the different frequency, and then ultimately the FDA will help determine um, if there's any relationship in major events as well, because they're looking at all of that data across the United States and if it's an international trial um, at any global sites as well. And if, and if you can imagine, during that visit with your physician when you're in a trial, they will go through a checklist. Um, Catherine mentioned, like, she gave the example of headaches, but they will go through a list of things that may be side effects um, of the drug, and they will question you. If there are, are um, symptoms that are not listed, then you should definitely also share that with your physician who will share it with the sponsor. Right, and to play off of that, so the different phases of trials that I talked about, anything that's found out in phase one is told to investigators going into phase two, told to investigators going into phase three, so during those whole courses of those phases, we're identifying those expected risks up front and those expected side effects. So we know to ask you, are you feeling dizzy? Do you have headaches? Because we've seen that before. And then if you have something that says, hey, I don't, I'm not dizzy or I don't have headaches, I can't, I feel shortness of breath. That's a new side effect and we write that down. And then we be, there's a whole other process of assessing whether or not that's related, um, which is what I was alluding to before. Great, thank you. Next question. Uh, how common are crossover trials, and do patients participating in crossover trials continue to receive compensation during treatment? Um, usually, if you are enrolled in a, a crossover trial where they're providing the drug to you for free at that point, they are not compensated um, because they're providing the, the care around the drug and the drug itself. Um, the commonality of crossover trials depends on the type of trial they're looking at, so the different diseases. Um, I believe that they're a little bit more common in IBD than they are in others, but I can't give you an exact percentage because it's not really my area of expertise on that one. Lovely, any thoughts on that? No? It, it, it depends. I think CCFA would probably be able to give you a little bit more information about that if you wrote them a note. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question, can I continue to work with my gastroenterologist and primary care doctor during the study? Yes. Um, anything that happens to you during the trial, um, if the doctor who's conducting the trial is not your primary care um, doctor, he uh, or she should be communicating the type of information that comes across because it's all part of your clinical care. Just because it's part of a trial doesn't mean it's not part of your medical care. So the information that becomes available during those testing um, should be shared with your physician. So feel free to work with them. Feel free to tell them what you're doing. Um, the more people who know about it, the better care you're going to receive. And just um, to piggyback on that, when I was um, participating in the clinical trial, um, my doctor was very engaged because fortunately for me, I thought it was a good thing, 
I started losing weight. And so um, to explain that to her, I had to let her know that I was in a clinical trial and that it was one of the great side effects for me. Right, and another example that I have from actually conducting clinical trials is a lot of times when we do blood work, we'll find high triglycerides, which means there's a high cholesterol, or your blood or your blood pressure is higher um, than average, and we will communicate that to your primary care physician because that's something that needs to be treated um, outside of the trial just because it's something that should be treated. So I know that I personally have shared information with primary care physicians to help um, round out the care of a patient. Great, thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, when would I find out about the study results? Are participants given the data on the trial findings? That is something that we are constantly working on um, in terms of getting that more, more accessible. Some sponsors will send communications to participants and say, hey, we found out great news. Here's what we've seen. Some don't. Um, sometimes that information comes about in publication so that somebody's gotten together and written an article. Um, and Research Match is working on providing a way to match up um, studies off of clinical trials that go with results and put those results out publicly on our site so that they're publicly available. Any findings um, that are found on studies registered in clinical trials that does are expected to be reported there as well. Um, sometimes your doctor may know because they've read the literature, so they'll tell you. There really is not a standardized way of how results are communicated, unfortunately. It's something that we are constantly pushing for on our end in terms of patient advocacy to get more information about that and make it more common so that people can know how their participation has changed um, the world around them. And I think it's important that patients um, know um, how, that they, how they've contributed to the research. And like Catherine said, we are working here at Research Match to create a venue for dissemination. What we want patients to know from the studies that our match from clinicaltrials.gov and, and also our in research match is what is the clinically meaningful information they can glean from these studies. So when you read something about vitamin E, it's great for you. Do you know if that's the vitamin E that you buy at your local Walgreens or is it something more potent that could um, have a better benefit to your health? So that's what we're trying to create is this platform for you to understand what's clinically meaningful and that you can share with your doctor or your doctor can share with you. Great. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Catherine and Leslie, for your presentation and for answering the participant questions. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, before we conclude the program, I just wanted to provide some in helpful information for, for some of the listeners. So if you have any additional questions about clinical trials, you can reach out to CCFA's IBD Help Center Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at 888 694-8872 by email at info at ccfa.org or you can even chat with us online uh, with an information specialist directly via our answer chat and you can find more information on CCFA's website which is www.ccfa.org. If you would like to watch other educational webcasts on IBD, please visit the website on the screen to explore other topics on Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You can also connect with other IBD patients and engage in discussions through CCFA's community website, our support groups, as well as our Power of Two peer-to-peer -peer mentor program. And another resource that we have is GI Buddy, which is a tracking tool and a mobile app that has everything you'll need to stay on top of managing your inflammatory bowel disease. And for more information on GI Buddy, you can go to ccfa.org backslash GI Buddy. And another way you can play a role in research is by becoming a CCFA partner. CCFA Partners is an internet-based study that can help researchers better understand IBD while providing you with the tools and resources that you need to help manage your health. And when becoming a CCFA partner, you will join over 14,000 members that are already a part of this patient-powered research network. Uh, you can also participate in other education events by connecting with your local CCFA chapter, uh, which you can find by visiting CCFA's website. 
And if you're looking for a way uh, to give back, our Take Steps Walk program offers a wonderful way for family and friends and the community to raise mission critical funds to help us find a cure. And our walk events are filled with live music and food, kids entertainment, and educational materials. And you can learn more by visiting www.cctakesteps.org. Uh, you can also join our team challenge events uh, with these half marathon, full marathon, triathlon, Ironman, and cycling training programs. You'll train for a rewarding and exciting endurance event at one of our great destination races. And you can find more information by visiting www.ccteamchallenge.org. And also, your feedback is very important to us as it helps us improve and develop future programs. So in the chat box within the webinar uh, toolbar on the right, you will find a link to our evaluation. So please be sure to complete this brief evaluation uh, before you depart. And on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America and ResearchMatch, thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.